Thank you, Sam, for raising really very pertinent questions. We have now two discussants, and I think they'll speak for about five, seven minutes each, less if you would like to. Uh, uh, so the first discussant is Sering Shakya from the University of British Columbia. Sorry. First, I'd like to thank Ashok and New School and everyone who's involved in organizing this conference. And, and it's been really interesting, and um, I learned a lot. And I'm not sure whether I'm the right person to comment on religion, because uh, I'm um, sort of too much of a positivist and a Marxist to understand religion, you know. I may just simply dismiss this as part of superstructure and false consciousness. So there's nothing much to talk about. <laughs> so this is a bit, so I thought, then, then I can't do that. It's very impolite to come to invite you to a meeting and then just dismiss everything. But, um, you know, it's, it's like, um, you, new, uh, there's certain things about Tibetan religion and things. If you look at from, from the Victorian eras of the travelers or the early scholars who work on Tibetan, they were always, uh, they had this attitude to do, it was very similar to what we're talking today, but they had this sort of the Tibetan Buddhism, sort of ecological determinism of religion. You know, Tibetan, these people are superstitious, heathen bunch, you know, because they are intimidated by their environment. They live in this mighty mountain soaring up the air, and these little people got intimidated by this mountain, and they got frightened, and they believe in gods and gods and things, you know. That explained everything about Tibetan Buddhism. You know, that was a dominant paradigm of writing about Tibetan Buddhism in, until, I would say, 1960s. Now we have age that the Tibetans and the indigenous people are wonderful. They're the custodian of nature and they're the stewards of the environment. But as um, <laughs> James sort of paper on uh, Sher Sherpas illustrated, Tibetans are quite pragmatic, you know. I mean, if it makes money, they do it, you know. It doesn't matter, you know. If you want to be so sell health conscious, you know, all the Sherpas in New York, it's amazing. This, you know, they corner the health food stores in New York. You can, somehow New Yorkers think the Sherpas know all about the health food. I don't know. So well, if you think, you, you, you think we know all about the health food, okay, fine, we'll sell you health food. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so we have, so I think Tibetans are also very pragmatic in that. So if you want us to be ecological conscious, yes, we'll be ecological conscious. We'll explain everything to you <laughs> through our deities. So there's certain kind of pragmatism there. And uh, some ways I'm sort of really quite skeptical about environment and uh, development. Sometimes I personally find it sort of, when I go to Tibet and Himalayas, and there's all these NGOs teaching Tibetan herders and nomads about how to be env environmentally sensitive. And I just look at my God, you know, these people have done the least damage to the environment, and you're teaching them how to be environmentally sensitive, you know. The cost of your airplane flying you the training would have done more, infinitely more damage than the entire life cycle of these nomads. You know, so somehow is there uh, this kind of assumption that now also we assumption that the knowledge possessed by the indigenous community has somehow has a sort of remedy for the, our ecological problems in that. And um, it is true in a way there is. Uh, deep sort of Dan should, you know, in the film and in his paper, there is a deep sort of Tibetan connection with the environment. When we look at how sort of, if you read Manakambum, the, it's like, it's Manakambum is the Tibetan uh, book of Genesis. It's the beginning of the world, Jigden Chajul. It's the beginning, tells of the whole world, it's the beginning and then, you know, it is, I think it should, no Tibetologists have translated fully, but if some Tibetologists, this will become Bible of New Age environmentalism. Yeah. It is wonderful, it's a poetic language, it tells you how the universe is formed, how the earth is formed, and how everything's so dependent on each other. It is really should be, but it's so complex to translate. It's Manukambu. So, if you want flavor of Manikambu, there's a book uh, by Tubden Nobu and Colin Turnbull. 
And uh, in the first, in the beginning of the universe, the, uh, Colin Turbull, he's an uh, anthropologist, but he writes so well in English. His English writing, so I mean, the book is <laughs> old and it's interesting, it's good, interesting, but his writing style is so enjoyable. So if you want some flavor of Mani Kambul, read uh, to the, um, Colin Turnbull and to the Nobus book, and the first page of the Jigden Churchill, that's a, not a complete translation, but it's rendering of uh, uh, Jigden Churchill. So it's really wonderful. Thing. There's a, in the way, that is that. Dan asked a really important question, which uh, Marxists and, and um, positives can't answer. Do you know the mountains that have subjectivity? You know, I just can't answer. I mean, it's really um, interesting question, and how we do that. So, do, do, do the mountains going to speak to you and tell you they have subjectivity, or you going to infer a subjectivity on uh, mountains? So how much of this inferring we are doing in terms of when we're talking about um, environment and the indigenous community and local knowledge? You know, how, what inference are you making based on this assumption? And this is a, a, a German paper on uh, uh, um, this sort of development in the Northeast. It's really interesting. It's this transition in modern state, development state, where the state sovereignty is really defined in terms of productivity, the right to productivity. And, you know, this is America and Canada just really regretting this thing about it. And they're just thinking, God, we wish we, we were clever as the Chinese. Because they gave the indigenous, the, the First Nation and the Native American uh, uh, land rights and did not claim productivity right over these native lands. Now they can't build anything because every time the, the Canadian uh, wants to build a pipeline or mining, the indigenous community vote against it, but they don't, uh, Canada and the United States don't have productive right over this native land. But what you see in Latin America, Northeast India, and Tibet and China where the minorities live, that the government has taken the productivity right over this thing. They don't mind you living on the land, but if we find a, a minerals in there, it's government going to come and dig it up for you. So this is absolute change in notion of sovereignty, notion of rights. You know, it's not about right to live, but about right to productivity that is uh, happening. So in <coughs> this way, I think a um, lot of changes that are happening and uh, I think one thing really key, important, what we want to talk about the indigenous community local, the relation between us in the developed world, us as academic intellectuals, and the indigenous, there should be a symmetrical relationship, equal relationship of understanding. At the moment, we have a symmetrical, the burden of learning or burden of saving the earth falls on the indigenous community, and we are the one who's going to explain you how to do it. But when ultimately, we are the one who's responsible for destroying the earth. Thank you. Well, the next discussant is Catherine March from uh, Cornell University. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Vawa. Thank you also, Ashok and Jinnah and Toby, our participants here and there and everywhere, and especially to uh, Jeremy and Dan. They're hiding around here, there, there, and uh, Samuel for uh, these very interesting papers. Um, I think it's a particularly fitting set of discussions to uh, climax this uh, this this uh, conference, and I'm going to follow a bit on Saring's. Um, uh, uh, concerns here, uh, because it seems that some of the central questions governing our, our uh, interest in the topic here do revolve around the question of whether or not everyday religion cares about the earth, or as someone said yesterday, you know, whether Buddhists were green. Um, and this is a variant, of course, of questions that anthropologists and others have been asking about pre-modern, non-capitalist, isolated, traditional, take your pick, um, uh, peoples around the world as to whether or not they could could somehow uh, be understood as being better custodians or protectors of the environment. And as these papers, paper, all of these papers, but particularly the three uh, in this section, uh, make clear, there are indeed multiple and varied and magnificently different ways in which uh, communities around the world differently envision the, the environment and their place in it. Um, Jeremy's concrete, and I'm going to skip some of 
I want to. I'll, I'll applaud them individually, all right? Um, uh, but I think that the, uh, the very question of how green uh, people who live in these distant valleys might be uh, is uh, the wrong question. Uh, green, it seems to me, uh, and I'm partly drawing here on Yu's idea of greenwashing, and of course, um, thanks Herring for his passion. Uh, green seems to me is clearly a postmodern position. Uh, it's like Renato Rosaldo's uh, call a naming of some of uh, anthropology as imperialist nostalgia, uh, something that precisely laments the loss of the very thing that they've been implicated in destroying. Uh, but still, I think there are at least two important things that we could learn uh, both from these papers and from the people's uh, upon whose everyday religion their uh, observations are based. And the first one is that dominion, whether we think of it as control leading to destruction or frame it in other ways, is clearly not the only possible human position in relation to the natural world. Uh, I say this with very great caution, and I commend to all of you Gregory Bateson's original Steps to an Ecology of Mind, and particularly his essay on conscious purpose, uh, in which he argues that it's a pretty widespread human uh, predilection uh, to try to um, manipulate the world around them for their own sometimes short-sighted benefit. Uh, and, but I do think that, and this also comes out of my own experience, uh, as a, um, a very young woman, my family hosted a woman from Thailand, who one of whose first comments when we could finally figure out how to communicate uh, was that how disappointed she had been when she was riding on the airplane to come to uh, the US that, that she hadn't seen any of the Buddhas out the window. She really assumed that they were sitting on the clouds. And I don't want to hear, say, make the, turn this into a naive, these people believe this or that. The same thing came back when our long-term and extremely talented field research associate, Suryaman Tamang, um, made almost the identical comments on his first trip to the United States that he couldn't sleep when he was traveling because he wanted to look to see. All of his imaginings about where the highest divinities he knew had positioned them sitting on top of clouds. And so here he was above the clouds. He was going to, he had two things actually that he was pleased to see. One, it was true that a large part of the world was water, which he'd learned in his, his uh, school textbooks. But the other was, that the gods weren't sitting there. But this idea that divinity is not something in a nice little Durkheimian way set off in sacred spaces apart from everyday existence is clearly not um, the only way in which uh, individuals around the world, non-naive, pure, wholly modern <laughs> contemporary peoples can look at the relationship um, between human um, uh, subjectivities and non-human subjectivities. Um, all of these, ha what I want to suggest is that all of these do, and here I think that um, Dan's paper is very important, uh, attribute or recognize um, personhood in the planet. Uh, and this, this is not just in, and I love the expression when we talk about ecology and conservation and the lament of many conservationists that all people care about are the mega, the charismatic mega fauna. Well, I don't, here I also want to make sure that uh, even those of us who work among the charismatic mega geology of the world, uh, it is not just those um, mighty mountains that require um, recognition or possibly could, um, could be well served by recognition of a different kind of position um, identifying their their intrinsic subjectivity, their sameness in that regard with us, so that they would require positions from us of reciprocity, maybe even nurture, um, respect, maybe even submission, and avoidance, maybe even um, protection. And I commend a second absolutely marvelous source, which I'm astonished that I've heard no one here mention, Julie Cruikshank, uh, writing uh, a wonderful book called Do Glaciers Listen? It, and the kind of um, deeply refined historical, ethnographic, narrative analysis, the, the detail to which she um, goes in describing the, the ways in which Northwest Coast communities with which she um, is so intimately familiar question, posit, doubt, and, uh, and celebrate or embrace 
um, the personhood in things like glaciers is exactly um, the kind of study that I think um, the best in these papers can, um, can develop. But there, the, the other thing that I think is really important, uh, if, if besides just recognizing that these, this is, um, that this is um, we have to ask questions about why, why would we um, animate the earth? Uh, or why would we recognize in used terms um, the subjectivity in land? And I think we have some partial answers. Most of these papers, especially these three, um, describe in rather painful detail the kinds of pressures against people being able to maintain an animate perception of the world around them. That, so why is there not the possibility of animating the earth? And we have um, Jeremy's account of um, the rise of tourism and the um, and park histories. These are all pressures that make it increasingly difficult for people to sustain an interpersonal relationship um, with their environment qua co-person. Um, use argument um, about uh, resisting the new era of economic growth and the and the and concerns about strategies of development, uh, asking questions of who's in charge here, uh, and Thomas's uh, look at the the particular collisions of strategies of land management, land registration, conservation of st of strategic. Um, um, species uh, and different communities' response to these are all, yeah, I think, very, very important steps um, in this direction of answering why can't people sustain uh, animate visions of the planet. But I think to answer why it is that people do animate the Earth, we need to do um, two very different kinds of things, and this here I'm speaking really as a very flat-footed contemporary anthropologist. One, pardon me, Tsering, is cultural, and it looks at the kinds of things that say, how do we articulate cultural processes of difference? Um, uh, I think Antonio's um, discussion yesterday about exchange and reciprocity is a good example of this. There are logics of exchange, logics of reciprocity, logics of inversion and identification. Um, use our uh, discussion of affective bonding, um, naming, uh, some of the things that started this conference, the logics uh, or the, of water the, as total social facts. All of these are things that are ways in which we could understand what kinds of forces uh, sustain the, the visions of Earth as an antimate, um uh, subjectivity in its own right and in relation to us. And the other, and here I will thank Tsering again, uh, is really to look at the other side of the coin, and that is to look very clearly at political economies, especially especially political economies of exclusion. Um, and I'll steal, I'm not sure I've got it exactly right, um, Jeremy's, the rich go to the office and the poor go to the forest. Um, we know that today's so-called traditional societies are not remotely, they are, but well, that's the wrong choice of word, they are not continuous with um, ancestral ways. Uh, they have not been living in the way they've been living, no matter how remote their bayul, uh, in the ways of their ancestors. By and large, they have been pushed into those environments by the rise of, of states and um, by history. So I think what we need to ask then is how is what, what aspects we see in the world today of, of a vision of a personalized and animate Earth, to what extent are these, um, in James Scott's words, weapons of the weak, or perhaps even manifestations of an ecological zomia? And here, uh, I want to um, conclude by drawing on um, and um, honor of, to wish you all a very happy International Women's Day, uh, to draw some parallels to the earlier Western discovery of what was then called women's informal associations. Um, those of you who were um, active in the time, maybe even alive in the time, may remember that uh, there was a time when international development despaired of um, reaching 
uh, very poor and isolated and, and excluded peoples and saw women's informal associations as these wonderful repositories of creative and resilient um, energy, as controlling a lot of the resources that made survival of the poorest in adverse circumstances possible. So what did they decide to do? They were going to harness those. They were going to tap them, all right? Um, not at all aware that precisely the adaptive strengths that they saw in those associations were the struck were, were created were response to the structural weaknesses of their position. My favorite example was uh, consulting for a, um, a sort of a, an anti-AIDS um, and women's health, not anti-women's health, anti pro-women's health, anti-AIDS. Um, a uh, group that wanted to set up uh, women's health clinics in a country where, I'll leave it nameless, in a country where prostitution was illegal and strongly um, um, policed, to set up clinics called Prostitutes Health Clinics. <laughs> and then they were astonished that nobody showed up. All right. Um, similarly for us, I think that the caution that I want to make here is that we can't afford to repeat these same errors with respect to opening up projects that say green protection society for the world, right? Um, consider, and I'll just, uh, uh, consider waste and overconsumption. It is clearly a fact that poor people produce less waste. But it is not clearly, or it is pretty clearly, that it is not because they necessarily have a higher consciousness of not producing, they just don't have stuff to produce waste from. When I first worked in Nepal, which was an era when everyone said that the place was going to be deforested by the year 2000 at the latest, and of course, one of the miracles of Nepal's um, conservation has been to turn that around quite handsomely. Um, households used, on average, less than one Coke bottle, and I mean the kind of Coke bottle that's in Nepal, that's kind of like this dollhouse size thing, of kerosene a year. I mean, they, 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 were, they were not responsible for um, the overconsumption in the world, as Saring has pointed out. Or consider Thomas's um, uh, uh, evocation of um, administrators' ideas that there's empty forest out there in the world. Oh, we know it's a fact that people have been engaged in projects of terraformation forever. So the question is not how can we harness green philosophies, the green philosophies of traditional peoples, um, but rather, uh, two point of thing what can what can we learn from them surely um, but recognizing that this is probably a strategy of unlearning and and a, a strategy of figuring out how we can countermand the forces that are today actively obstructing subverting overriding our potential for topo or terraphilia and I uh, close with um, a sticker I wish I had been quick enough to put it into the computer. There's a sticker in the uh, women's bathroom here that uh, suggests that we should all should test the quality of the water by trying to light it before we use it. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Catherine. And I'd like to invite all the speakers and the pen, uh, discussants to the dais. And uh, we have, I think, about 20 minutes for general discussion and questions. And uh, let me make sure everybody's seated. All right, uh, there is one there. Let me identify three or four people first. One there, back. Okay, let's take three questions first. Uh, yeah, first. Hi. Hello? Hello, hello? Hello, hello, hello. Hello? Okay, now it's on. Hi, my name is Lily Ling. I teach international affairs here at the New School. Uh, my comment is directed at Dr. Yu and um, uh, Dr. Shakya. Um, I uh, recently finished a book on the Tao of world politics, where I draw on the Buddhist concept of interbeing for world politics. 
So I was very excited to hear uh, Dr. Yu talk about interbeing and intersubjectivity as an active concept because in where we need it most in this world is in world politics. Um, in doing my research on interbeing, I came across the uh, cosmovision of the people of the Andes, and they have a very similar idea about their mountains having subjectivity, uh, their mountains having um, an active impact on the lives uh, of the people there. And, um, and this is a comment directed at Dr. Shakia when you say the, the state has the right of productivity. Uh, yes, that's correct. But the local peoples of the Andes have been very successful in mobilizing action against extractive uh, industries supported by the state in their sacred mountains by drawing on the language, the concepts, and the passion that they have for their mountains and the relationship that they have with their mountains so that uh, the situation is not as dire as you may suggest that the state is all powerful, comes in and extracts resources from these areas that local people consider sacred. It's precisely because they consider these areas sacred that they are able to mobilize political action against the state. And they were successful in stopping these mining companies <laughs> from coming in. And if we look at some of the political developments that have been happening in Latin America, we see that there have been a lot of political mobilization based on the language, the rhetoric, the, as I say, the passions of uh, this uh, indigenous understanding of a subjective relationship with the earth uh, that now has an impact on the state and has an impact on politics. Thanks. Sorry, if, I, if you could be very brief in your yes, response, absolutely. I think that would be very helpful. I, I will be very brief in Dr. Ling's uh, uh, comments. I want to re respond. Inter interbeing, the way I use, is not necessarily with the Buddhist idea of interbeing, um, but I can draw on that. I, I, my understanding of a Buddhist interbeing and Thich Nhat Hanh and other uh, teachers I'll mention, it's the sentience that connects all of us and then the prisoners breathe the same air and the murderers spend the same money, whatever. And then something that connects all of us and we breathe the same air, we have the consciousness, the ca capacity. And my emphasis of energy being is on the earth itself because that's the totality that we stand upon. A lot of times our visual contact is minimum because it contacts our soul, I mean our feet. Um, but on the other hand, we should look at, I mean, I recommend all of us look at the landscape, but not as a flat place. It has three dimensions, and in Tibetan, say, sasam, and the, the celestial realm, what's above the surface of the earth, and beneath the surface of earth that connects us of all. In terms of subjectivity, I'll leave it uh, all of you for discussion, but speaking of uh, politics, and uh, I'm practicing a type of uh, uh, anthropology. I would call it, I use uh, Borowski's uh, uh, phrase, public anthropology. My role is to facilitate local figures, public intellectuals, to facilitate their knowledge to the greater realm of the world. Okay, thank you. Back there, yeah. I, um, just a tell first, um, the first account of Tibetan sort of uh, green protest in Tibet happened in 1918. In 1910, um, uh, the Dalai Lama sent uh, some Tibetan students to study in England, and one of them went to study at Camp On School of Mining, and he did mining engineering. And the Dalai Lama has been traveling, and he realized that Tibet really need to uh, um, exploit its resources and wanted to open mines. And so after he graduated, he went uh, uh, back to Tibet, and the Dalai Lama sent him all over Tibet to prospecting, and the ones could open up. See, so even the Dalai Lama was into mining then. So, um, and, uh, so he was, um, wanted to uh, explore. And uh, 1922, Charles Bell goes to Lhasa and meets the Dalai Lama, and then meets this mining engineer. 
And uh, in Charles, this is in his diary, which is in the Liverpool Museum, his handwritten diary. And Charles Bell, the, the mentor who was the um, mine engineer, gives a wonderful uh, uh, um, description. So, but when he went to village to village, where he, the villagers would not let him um, uh, prospect or break rocks, they surrounded him, and he was could not do any prospecting in any way in Tibet. Because every, every time he went, he was surrounded by villagers was, and chased out of the villages of uh, prospecting. And that's really interesting. You know, that was long before our green movements. So that was the incident of that happened. And uh, of course, so it, it is true, you know, the state claims rights, but of course they can be resisted. Every claim can be resisted. And turn, but of course it depends on the nature of the state and relationship between state and its citizen there. And about Buddhism, I mean, in, in real fundamental sense, Buddhism, everything is interdependent, you know, the, the dependent origination, then then yang la jung ni, you know, there's nothing which is not dependent on things. And causality, these are the essence of Buddhist philosophy. So, I mean, we cannot uh, uh, so have sort of something, Buddhism, so nothing is in a vacuum, so it has to receive everything in sort of interconnectedness in Buddhism. Uh, Again, I would like to have as many questions as possible. Uh, questions short, responses brief. Uh, respectfully, all the speakers and commentators, you had 15 minutes. And if you could keep your responses brief, we can have more questions. I have questions, people, people watching online. Uh, so back there. Hi. Um, my questions are for Dan. I really thank you for um, opening up some things that I've been trying to understand for a long time, and, I, and so I want to understand a little bit more. Um, you said something really interesting. I think you said, does the land choose the people, or do the people choose the land? And that really struck me, uh, especially in the, this age of globalization and, and travel. And So I wonder if you could expand a little bit more on that. And um, you also said that uh, Buddhism is, is relatively recent in this place um, and, and alluded to the pre-Buddhist religion, which I know there's a lot of debate about and the roles of the deities in the pre-Buddhist religion, but I'd like to hear your thoughts on that as well. Thanks. Shall I respond now? Yeah, I think when, when I get worried when the question comes in the form of want to hear thoughts, <laughs> that will take long, <laughs> so if you can. Again, you give a summary of the summary of your thoughts. That will be very helpful. <laughs> yes, yes, you are a good policeman here. Um, and thank you, Elizabeth. And uh, um, when I say place chooses people or pla uh, pe uh, people chooses place, it's a mutual kind of a relationship. It's, uh, to me, it's never one-sided because uh, there are existing studies on sacred sites and in, and in human dwelling places a lot of times Let's talk about the forces of a geology. And geology itself already created this, uh, our pre I, I, we would later recognize a sacred place, but existed there already. And then when, and, and uh, James Gibson used the phrase affordance, that Earth affords us many affordances. When, once uh, these affordances are latent until we laid our eyes on it and we have some connection with it, it's, it's, uh, the affordance starts talking to us. And then the affordance in, in the many ways that choose us to be part of it. Let's say a wolf's, a cave is not a wolf's den until the wolves walks in there. I love that place. I'm gonna have a cups there and then that's my place. So um, this is what I meant. And then in terms of a Buddhism, I really see that um, uh, in my ethnographic is I really, I reject the idea of me representing Tibet. I'm only work case by case. Tibet is a huge place, very diverse. So in my case, I see this type of Buddhism is kind of a uh, syncretized Buddhism with the pre-Buddhist uh, pre practices of a land and recognition of uh, their earth gods. And they convert these gods into, uh, I would call the supernatural Buddhists. They're in the mountain sitting there, and then the, and the scene is the body of the gods, etc. So that builds the relationship. I just want to add one more thing. So there's a shared hierarchy between humans and the mountains slash mountain gods. The mountain gods actually are weather makers. It just waters and hails, etc., coming down on your crops. 
But humans also has a power because we possess the ritual technology. We invoke a Buddha, etc. We negotiate with you and say, stop making bad weathers. We only need good weathers. That's how the relationship is built. Thank you. Okay, let me take a different approach. Uh, <laughs> I'll have four questions all at the same time, and then people will respond. I have one question from people watching online, and the question is from Dr. or uh, Mr. Basong Yongji Sherpa from North Carolina, and the question is for Jeremy. Considering the heterogeneity of traditional knowledge, can Sherpa religion be used to address environmental challenges? Hold on. And then I have a question there and question from Mr. Lama. Thank you, Richard Jordan from International Council for Caring Communities with a 30-second recommendation for Ashok that requires no response from the panels to save time. Um, the UN Statistical Commission has developed 13 documents like this, three quarters of an inch thick, on the valuation of ecosystem services. I would recommend next seminar that if you don't bring in the statisticians and the UN policymakers who can benefit from a discussion and an enlightened uh, vision, um, this, this stuff isn't going to reflect what you are talking about, which is essential for the development of ecosystem and environmental statistics. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, uh, you know, uh, Samuel's presentations and uh, what uh, uh, Jeremy's presentations. Uh, you know, the case of Sikkim, which is essentially a state where Buddhism is practiced, right, where nature is worshipped. The case which uh, Samuel said that you have the highest per capita uh, availability of uh, hydro hydropower projects in the world. For every 18,000 people, there is a hydropower project in, in, in Sikkim today, mm -hmm. right? That is the situation. And I think there is a three very beautiful combinations, very dangerous on the other side of it. The first is combinations of the in independent power producers coming together with political pa party to, to harness what you call the economic reforms led market. This is one side. The other side, of course, is a total disconnect between the federal government, which gives environmental clearances with the people of Sikkim. Right. This is the because the remoteness of the area, and the third, of course, is the independent power producers. All of most of them are doing power, uh, the hydropower projects for the first time. They do not know. They have never seen a mountain area, first of all, right? And they are doing it purely for what you call uh, the the business purpose, and uh, and and the, and the people are suffering. So the the here here the question is, how, how do we relate? Religion, how do we relate religion with nature and the institutions of governance? Thank you. And I have one more question from uh, Mr. Debrata Sen from Atlanta. And I'm going to try to summarize the question. And the question is for Dr. Yu. How can we talk about material material agency in a non-essential world? I think something you probably referred to, and, and you have to make an inference here, and I think you are very good at that. Am I? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> material agency. While being aware of what, uh, what Dr. Marsh just referred to as the political economy of exclusion, and maybe one of you can comprehend that question and address that. So we have, uh, 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 e uh, what I mentioned, either you or Dr. Marsh. So material and, did you? Material agency. Material, material and agency? Agency. Okay. Ma material agency. Yes. And? Uh, okay. Okay. All right, let's, let's go with you first. Okay. Yeah. 
I want to say hi to Pasang, who is a newly minted PhD from Washington State University. Very good. Hi, Pasang. Great question. Yeah. Um, I do believe that Sherpa ecological knowledge and place-based spirituality can assist in the management of what we'll call them mixed cultural and natural resources. But I do not think that it can be done by the Sherpa alone. Uh, the, the resource footprint of Sagamatha National Park far exceeds any system that was created before tourism became to the area. So it requires a collaboration or a col collaborative learning between the Sherpa, the National Park, NGOs, and Western scientists, and especially Sherpa themselves uh, who have the agency to take control of this situation and make decisions. Lastly, I think that any um, Natural resource management uh, using Sherpa cultural values must be youth focused. If it's not youth focused, then I believe that the program won't work, uh, especially working with the youth clubs in the area, the women's groups, um, with a keen eye on gender. But uh, the youth have by and large been left out, and there's been a generational difference in the participation in projects. And I think that if we integrate the youth as leaders, uh, and emerging leaders and existing leaders with this collaborative learning framework, then we can move forward. Well, let me let me repeat the, repeat the expression and say what I understand. In a material agency, in a non-essentialist way, I think this is one of the problems. We have tended to essentialize um, this um, capacity to imagine um, agency in the material world, to animate the earth, um, to think of it as sentient. Uh, and there is a great danger of essentializing it, of imagining that somehow Sherpas, qua Sherpas, know more about herbal, <laughs> herbal remedies than, than other people, in the same sort of way that that has been done often about women as um, keepers of caring. Uh, whether that's caring for um, the planet or caring for um, uh, other, other people. Uh, I'm not sure I know how we do that, but I, clearly a, a very important first step is to recognize that we do uh, have a very um, uh, recursive tendency to do that. We keep, we keep trying to imagine that somehow it resides in some kinds of people because of who they are. And I think here, um, the, the only sort of uh, anecdote that I can imagine as a first bitter pill is um, to really look at those political economies of exclusion and understand that it is not something intrinsic uh, to um, some people that they uh, don't kill uh, uh, the crocodile. I can't remember. The garwal. I always forget the name of them. Dolphin, the dolphin, yeah, all right. Uh, but something, something that we need to understand ba better about um, their relation to things like um, what um, Dr. Lamas talked about, um, the government, government practices, um, tourism practices, economic practices, things like that. Thank you. Uh, uh, Sam? Yeah, thank you, uh, Professor Lama, for that question. Uh, yes, there are real dangers. Uh, especially when the state is, you know, mediating resource capture by private producers and, you know, throwing all its might, you know, behind these projects. Uh, but some of the most robust uh, contestations and challenges to, you know, the government plans have come from communities who see these lands as sacred, who see their rivers as, you know, sacred and that they need to be protected. But um, we didn't see, you know, alliances emerging, you know, we didn't see others complement these community, you know, protests, uh, you know, so it was just uh, arguments of sacred. But we know that these areas are biodiversity rich. We know that, you know, dams are dangerous in seismic areas. Um, so I think we need new alliances, you know, uh, people and their perceptions of, you know, uh, and you know, sacred landscapes. Plus, you know, the work of uh, knowledge institutions like, you know, universities and you know NGOs. Yeah. yeah, I add a little. Um, mm -hmm. I, uh, yeah, I agree uh, with uh, uh, Kathy's uh, uh, perspective on non-essential. But as an anthropologist, it is a social science. Now, I'm not a positivist, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but we all make generality. We all recognize patterns, and then I feel that's as a, as a social scientist, it's uh, it's my mission to understand that. The pra ecological practices of uh, uh, that my, my ethnographic case, then it's fair to recognize its patterns 
And I want to emphasize again the patterns I found is that there are some boundaries and bondings and plays and ancestors and gods and animals and domesticated and wild, and you draw a line there and then maintain a relationship because bonding does not mean that you don't have relationship. Bonding is about relationship. And uh, so in a sense that I'm not sure I understand a non-essential way, but let me do my anthropological work. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I will have, I think, one or two more questions. And those are the last questions. And if you think your question should have priority, wave your hand vigorously. <laughs> and if it can't wait, and that's how I'm going to identify the last two people. Yeah, one here and one there. OK, very good. Brief. Yes. I just wanted to ask a couple of questions. Um, one to Jeremy Spoon. Uh, I thought it was really interesting how you uh, showed that some um, uh, indigenous uh, beliefs are eroding, like the Lu, the powers of the spirit Lu are weakening in people's minds, are very, whereas the goddess Kumbhila mm -hmm. is, uh, is actually, her powers are increasing. Um, and this is an interesting effect of globalization, I guess, in that local uh, space. So I was wondering if you could say a, a little more about how that happened. Or is, again, maybe is it the pragmatism of the people uh, that's at, at play? And the other question was to Dr. Yu about, uh, you had said something also, a very interesting presentation about caves and how the caves the energy in the caves uh, synchronizes the mind with the energy of the cave. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you had some research or something on that. The reason I'm asking also is because there's a lot in neuroscience now. A lot of the, um, I'm a psychologist, a cross-cultural psychologist, so a lot of, I think there's a lot happening in psychology, especially around uh, looking at energy mm -hmm. systems and uh, the brain. And I was in a cave in India, actually, not long ago, <laughs> in uh, where a meditation cave where they s they said the same thing, that the cave synchronizes the brain patterns. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering. I would I would consider that as a very useful comment, and if Dr. Yu wants to respond, he can do that after the session is over. So one more question, very quick one. So uh, I have a question for the Jeremy Spoon. No? So um, people, when we talk about tourism development, people like to think it's a pollution uh, for the local people's mind and for the, uh, for the environment. But how do you think about the dynamic relationship between tourism development and uh, the local society? Uh, and just like, some, just like people mentioned, the authenticity of the, of the tourism on the local culture. And just, uh, maybe you can tell us something more about subjectivity. I mean, who is, uh, how, according to your understanding, and so who is the subjectivity in the, in the tourism development, the mountain, the mountain deity, the local people, all the outside intruder, like, like tourist and the anthropologist, or the UNESCO? So who should take the responsibility for the subjectivity role? Thank you. Great. Wonderful question. Thank you. Um, let's see. I would say that tourism is a positive in the Kumbu area, and I think the, I'm going to take a political economic perspective on that, but I, I consider that uh, Sherpa have bended tourism desires for their own gain. Sherry Ortner has been very good at documenting this, but the uh, agency of the Sherpa has increased by their ability to control some of the modes of production. They don't control all of it, and they don't have full governance of the area. I don't want to paint an ideal picture, but they do have control of some of the businesses, and they have the ability to not be passive in the tourism dialogue. And I think that is really, really important um, aspect of how tourism is framed there. Um, there has been a lot of host-guest exchange in that area, and you s you're seeing that in my presentation, what the response of that is. Uh, the transnational community that you have here in the United States is also a, re a result of that tourism contact. Many Sherpa try and get sponsored by tourists to send their children to school, et cetera. These are not new things. Um, I do look at it as a very interesting uh, uh, development, especially because Mount Everest cannot go away. So if people were tourizing, tour, touring megafauna, forests, water sources, they can be degraded, but the mountain is not necessarily going to go away. So the resource that the tourists want to consume or gaze upon is fixed. 
That said, the resources needed to support that industry are not, and that's where you're seeing this negotiation happen. So therefore, I think you need other actors involved in this uh, to help in this situation because it's so far exceeding the resource management tradition of the local people. Thank you. Uh, let me really summarize these very complex and very rich discussions in 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. I was told that if I don't end the session by noon, <laughs> I will not get reimbursed for my travel expenses. <laughs> so this is the reason for being very brutal, and I hope uh, you will forgive me. I think a very rich discussion. I think it's not fair to summarize it in 30 seconds or 45 seconds. What I've heard is that everyday religion, traditional practices, traditional knowledge is not a panacea for all of our problems. Our world is being shaped by very complex forces. And the pace of change is very rapid. And I like the practical suggestion by sharing Shakya. And I think it sums up, I think, what I, uh, the way I would have liked to sum up. I think we need a new coalition of academics, of local communities, other institutions. Of course, I use the word institution in a very broad sense, government organizations and other parties to come together, to work at specific landscapes, to come up with solutions. The world is also very heterogeneous. We have to recognize that. And so how we come together, generate new knowledge, I think those discussions will continue probably as, the, uh, as this uh, conference proceeds and br bring about these new partnerships to really address the complex challenges we face. And it's not, a single approach is not going to do it. Multiple approaches are not going to do it. It's not only the knowledge, but also the people who are on the ground that matter a great deal. And thank you very much. And I think organizers, I'm sure, they have some announcements, announcements to make. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Bawa, for leading an excellent session. Uh, and thank you to all the panelists and discussants. And thank you all for coming to uh, this very rich uh, you know, conversation this morning.